All right, I uh, I'm deep in UFO land again. I didn't think I would be, but it's because it is a pop pop culture phenomenon with the most recent Netflix hit show, Encounters. I'll bring this uh, article up on screen, and we'll all look at this together. So the uh, the Netflix UFO show Encounters is proving to be a big hit. Ah, uh, yes, the uh, documentary series, which is currently available on streaming platform, explores four major UFO incidents. Netflix has been offering up quite a bounty of documentaries with, for those uh, with an interest in the unexplained in recent years, with the Unsolved Mysteries reboot series offering up a plethora of general mysteries and the MH370, the plane that disappeared, covering the dif- disappearance of the Malaysian Airlines flight. Well, the... Uh, uh, the most recent one is Encounters, a four-part documentary series covering the world's most intriguing and enigmatic, enigmatic. I can't even say it right now. Enigmatic, enigmatic UFO cases. These include cases uh, of the Broad Haven Triangle and mass UFO sightings that happened over Texas. And uh, I started watching it. Got through the first two episodes. It's very well produced, very well done. It's done by uh, Steven Spielberg's production company, uh, Amberlin. Uh, Steven Spielberg. Yeah, Amber Lamps. Uh, he's, uh, he's always had a fascination with the unknown and extraterrestrials. So it, it really lends well to this series. It's done in a very serious way. Uh, they present multiple different angles to some of these uh, UFO encounters. The first one, which I will talk about this evening, is the mass UFO sighting that happened over Texas in 2008. And I was doing the podcast at the time, and I do believe I covered it. Um, but this is almost... Are you just going to play a clip of yourself then? Uh, I No, I'm not. I'm actually going to play a clip of uh, the TV show. By the way, before you get too far into this, so is this this series? I didn't realize that Spielberg was involved. That's interesting. Is this a is it a documentary series? Is it do they do reenactments? Is it like are they like doing semi fictional retellings of of reported events? How are they doing this? They are doing this with uh, interviews of the witnesses who have had the encounter or the sighting of the UFO. They do reenactments with most of the people that were there at the time oh the actual people yeah some of the actual people that were there they took part in the reenactment so i really appreciated that uh and it's not done like in a hokey goofy way like they really worked with these people and had the the right shot the right production to really lend to the overall atmosphere and aesthetic of the ufo encounter um this how much probing is there uh well i'm only two episodes in and there's not a lot a lot there's not a lot of probing just oh. yet damn um but the this first little clip here it's about 40 seconds long it in this is uh, from a, a guy who used to own a trucking company a uh, pretty well respected guy in the community going over what he saw over texas and he's just one of hundreds of people that witnessed this giant craft in the air uh right around 1 30 a.m it's been a long, cold winter, bad winter. That was the first day we had a decent day. So we came out here to the top of the hill to have a campfire. It was myself, Mike Odom, and Lance Jones. Then all of a sudden, I see some real bright, high-intensity lights off to the east, headed our way at a high velocity of speed. The lights was so bright, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was almost blinding to look at. High velocity of speed. And what amazed me is there was no wind noise, no engine noise. It was silence. Now, soon after this UFO passed overhead, two fighter jets followed this UFO. Um, There is radar data that was acquired by a MUFON person that uh, used a FOIA request to get that data. Uh, And so there's actual radar tracking of this object. Uh followed by the jets that came f- down from Fort Worth. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of corroborating evidence, eyewitness testimony. There are people of, uh, of reputation within the community that went on record. They were very hesitant to do so. Uh, but a lot of different people were on record, and it finally kind of broke 
And once one or two people started to speak out about it and the local paper reported on it, then other people felt, well, it's okay. Yeah, there's going to be ridicule, but we're going to come forward. And there was a lot of ridicule. There's a lot of black backlash and uh, so much so the, the FAA, who released the radar data uh, going forward, said they would no longer release radar data to by FOIA requests. So this is like the last uh, last major one where there was uh, some UFO incident and a FOIA request uh, helped prove that an incident did take place. Now, there's a lot of things going on in this place of uh, Stephenville, Texas. Uh, like what was going on there? There were multiple different uh, sightings, not just this major mass sighting, uh, but there was one two weeks previous. And so what was really going on there? And even a year before, so this took place in 2008, a year before in that very area, there were in 2007, March, uh, there were witnesses that were sleeping in their ranch home. They saw a bright shining light. Uh, three of them walked outside. They saw a craft that uh, had flashing lights. Next thing they knew, they were in a white room with two aliens that had large black plate like eyes, four limbs, you know, two arms and two legs. They were wearing uh, like jumpsuits. They did uh, like procedures on them, removed uh, skin samples and, and, and fluids from them. And the next thing they remember, they wake up and uh, they're lying on their front porch. Now, that incident was not in this documentary series. Uh, there was a lot more going on in Texas when it comes to UFOs and crazy encounters. Um, like it even goes back to like the, the late 1800s and the airship flap. Like Specifically in Stevensville, like in the late 1800s, uh, residents of that up-and-coming little town of Stevensville record that an airship came down from the sky, landed down, its occupants got out asking for help, and they said the occupants were uh, human-looking, and most likely they, they had some kind of newfangled dirigible, um, and they just needed a little help uh, getting it off the ground, and the townsfolk rallied together to help them lift back off again. And these people in the, the, the airship claimed that they were headed to New York by order of the capitalists that they are working for in New York uh, to perform some kind of job. But just bizarre stories like that that are cropping up from that area of like the Dallas Fort, Fort Worth area, uh, Stevensville. Uh, Texas is full of all this kind of bizarre stuff. It's uh, such a huge state. How could it not? Now, uh, another, this next little segment I'm going to play from the Netflix series I found to be the most interesting. So there was a, a week before the major UFO incident where 300 plus people saw something in the sky and went on a record with it. About a week before, there was a hunter named Ricky. He went out into the woods. He had this incredible experience of the sun being blocked out by this giant craft that was hovering overhead. Um he was uh, obviously shook up a little bit, but he had enough wits about him to take a look at this thing through the scope of his rifle. And he said through the scope of his rifle, this thing, this craft had no seams. It was completely smooth and that uh, he did see some interesting things. Suddenly. Now, the guy here who's talking here. This is the constable. He knows Ricky. And the, the, guy, the second guy who is going to talk is uh, the first guy who I played, which is the old truck driver um, who's going to wind down this, this clip. Suddenly, Ricky starts talking to everybody. I think Ricky saw a lot more than what the rest of us saw. Ricky has said he saw some sort of something inside the aircraft. And it resembled some sort of insect, or maybe even a praying mantis. I, I, th I think that Ricky was possibly approached by someone and offered a monetary agreement. Nate wanted him quiet. 
A military colonel called me one afternoon at my house, talked to me about an hour and 45 minutes. He says, we've had a lot of discussion about you and what to do with you. You're kind of a high profile guy. If you just was happened to come up missing, it kind of looks suspicious. It was a praying mantis, man. That's the only way I could describe it. Now, what Ricky saw through the window of that large craft that happened, uh, that was sighted about a week or two before the mass sighting, uh, he said he saw a praying mantis. And uh, we've read stories. Uh, Cretch, you remember we read that story of the, uh, the chap? The dude who got fired? The dude who got fired from the dog food factory because he was right. late to work because he was diverted. He was because, accosted. Uh, he was accosted by uh, a praying mantis man uh, out in the woods. And so he was uh, late for work. Uh, but the, the, the praying mantis alien... That type of alien is actually much more rare of a sighting than the, the, the little greys or even, I would say, the, the reptilians. The praying mantis, they, that's, a, that's a weird one. And it's harder, they're harder to track down when it comes to stories and, and or uh, possible uh, agenda with them. And if they owe you money. Uh, that's a big one. But uh, they don't like to pay <laughs> you. Never they, find them. They don't, they don't answer their phone. When no, they owe you. no. Fuckers. Now, in the uh, docu series, Ricky uh, says that he was harassed by uh, government men. Um, basically, told to shut up, stop talking about this. It's not worth your time. And uh, even so far, like the next time, like he went out to his truck, he found a single bullet on his dashboard. Uh, so he took that as a threat to just kind of shut up. And in that clip, you heard the as a the, present. Bullets are expensive. Yeah, I, I guess you know. Uh, but in that clip, you heard the constable say Ricky just kind of stopped talking to everyone and just you know, became a bit of a hermit because he didn't want to deal with it. Because in that at that time, 2008, uh, not only did he have to worry about the harassment, there's really no one you can turn to. There, the, the UFO subject was still one of a lot of ridicule. You're going to be called crazy. You're going to lose uh, your social standing, possibly your business. Uh, the one gentleman who owned the the trucking company. He became so obsessed with the topic and what he saw that his relationship with his wife suffered because he was he basically turned into that guy from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where uh, the lead character was obsessed with going to Devil's Tower to find out why his mind was so focused on this uh, geographical location that uh, he was single minded and it wrecked the, his personal relationships in his life. That's kind of what happened to this gentleman in this docuseries. Uh, now, when it comes to praying mantis men, uh, we've covered uh, various uh, praying mantis man stories uh, on, the sto on, the, on the show before we cover this one. It was a praying mantis man. That's the only way I could describe it. You can just look up, search for mantis in the OBDM search on uh, OBDM, rbigdumout.libson.com. And you'll find uh, every time we've ever talked about praying mantis people. Um, the story we talked about, Cratchit, where a guy, a, a young man, was fired from his dog food job uh, in the UK. And then I'll have this one. Now, this next this little story I'm going to convey to you, this has got a little bit of everything. And it's uh, pretty crazy, but they're we're talking about alien agendas we're talking about men in black we're talking about keeping information silent and this might shed a little light on some of this stuff so this comes from 1962 in new jersey and by the way this clip right here it was a praying mantis man that's the only way i could describe it that guy saw a praying mantis man in new jersey as well so this is uh 1962, right around uh, 6 o'clock p.m., and uh, the witness uh, was pregnant. Uh, she was on her way to visit her doctor on a well-traveled road. Uh, when she looked up into the sky, she saw this huge purple moon-like object. She pulled over to get a better look. The object seemed to fade out and become another color. It turned from purple to blue to green to silver. It just kept spinning and fading out. The next thing she remembers, uh, she's at her doctor's office, and it's 7.30 p.m. So there's about an hour of missing time, and uh, she did note 
at her doctor's office, she did acquire uh, a, almost like a sun tan burn like on her face. So uh, she was very close to something that was extremely hot or bright that burned her face. Years later, under hypnosis, she was able to remember what happened to her. Apparently, she was taken inside the craft uh, by uh, what uh, looked like something with large eyes. Uh, once inside, uh, she was taken to a small white room. Uh, she was pushed up against the wall by a creature resembling a praying mantis. Uh, there was a metallic slab behind her. There were two short, white, pale creatures with large black eyes uh, that dressed her. Uh, she was told that she would not be harmed. Uh, she was not told this verbally. She apparently was given this message uh, telepathically. Then uh, a reptilian-like creature entered the room. So just keep that in mind. So we got the we got praying mantis man. We have the short little guys with the big black eyes, and now we have a reptilian entering the room. Uh, she was led through the craft when uh, and she passed by several other rooms. She passed by a black room that she felt was uh, uh, not a very comfortable place to be. Then she passed by a gold room that she wanted to en enter, but she was not allowed to enter. And then the next room she was going to was a small pale pink colored room. And inside this room were 20 incubators, 10 on top, 10 on the bottom. She was shown what appeared to be like a Petri dish with embryos. Uh, in the 20th incubator, she saw a baby with a very large head with awkward colored slanted eyes. His hair was very sparse. The witness felt an immense love towards this uh, little hybrid baby. She was then led into a pale blue room where she saw 20 more incubators. There appeared to be creatures resembling tadpoles in these petri dishes so two different hybrid programs going on uh each incubator had a fetus in in a more developed state and when she looked into the 20th incubator she saw a baby reptilian like creature the whole time these two short pale creatures and a tall reptilian accompanying her so she's walking through and her escorts was a reptile and two little short gray guys uh, later, she was led to a pale yellow large room that resembled like a courtroom. And inside here, it was kind of misty. So they must have had a, like a fog machine going or something like that. Mostly for atmosphere, I'm assuming. Uh, at this point, the reptilian creature left her side. No longer needed. Uh, she was led in front of the room uh, by the two short little gray guys. Um, and then she saw this human looking entity um is super tall uh a good looking kind of nordic in appearance that seemed to be the leader he told her that she was judged tested and passed well she had no idea what this alluded to and at one point she looked at this nordic looking humanoid at an angle and he looked like he was a hologram like he wasn't fully there like semi-translucent then she noticed what appeared to be a small, thin wire going into her arm. Uh, she heard a strange sound, and the tall, blonde humanoid told her that they had given her knowledge that she would know what to do with at the right time. Well, that's all she remembers. She wakes up, and uh, that is her memory. And so, I mean, that's a little bit of everything. In, in that one, in that story right there, the praying mantis people are like worker bees. They're like worker ants. At the top are the Nordics. Below that, you have the reptilians. And below that, you have uh, the gray aliens. And then the insectoids are kind of like the worker bee race. And all the while, they're incubating and making hybrid babies cross between humans and the, the grays. And then it sounds like humans and like tadpole like frogs to create lizard people. It sounds insane, but that's her memory. And I, I, I actually, I kind of want to believe her. I think it's something that strange. It's probably true. So there we go. Uh, okay, that's all I got on that, Joe. Um, why don't we move over and see what you have? How about that? Yes. 
Yes. Uh, Mike, Mike before you leave the, uh, the, the parent or the uh, UFO stuff, yeah. why couldn't she go in the gold room? Uh, well, she was, be- she was being led along by her escorts, the reptilian and the two little greys. Yeah, but do you think maybe if somebody was a um, uh, a more higher status abductee, they could they'd be like, oh, and here's the gold room. It's only for our highest class abductees. Uh, I would imagine that uh, yeah, you you'd have to have some sort of qualification to get in there. Uh, Lord knows what's in that room. There's only speculation of what that could be. Um, <laughs> Is there? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it Is could it like the strip club private room. It's like the champagne room. The champagne you know? room. Yeah. It's, it's like the Centurion Club at the airport. You're like, you got to be a member. You can't, sorry, you can't, you can't be in here. The Continental Club. <laughs> or is it for the uh, the the multi time abductee to like? Did they stamp her card? And on the after the fifth visit, now she can go in the gold room. Uh, if these UFOs are not held down to one time or place, I suspect that room has something to do with like the astral realm, something that is uh, non physical. In nature, oh, we could we could put you in this room, but your brain could not comprehend what you're about to see in here. So, yeah, I think it would be something like that. It would be like instantly on like a DMT trip, and to shove somebody in that room <laughs> is 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 craziness. Bill, push him in the gold room. Yeah, it, it's a nice prank, but you don't want to someone you just abducted who's pregnant. You don't want to put him in there too. It might induce labor. You don't need that kind of stuff. It's, <laughs> Don't don't need that hassle. No, nah, I don't know. know. I mean, if they're probing stuff up your butt, I think that's the first thing you would do. Like, what what happens if we throw a pregnant lady in there? Uh, you may- so that does. <laughs> well, they tend to do at least all the stories that I've I've read. It is mostly physical experimentation. The mm. psychological is the psychological experimentation tends to be, if you want to even call it experiment, is sometimes when you are abducted, you will have uh, like electrodes or helmet put on you, and they will show you images on a screen. Typically, it is uh, a, like a movie or an image of the impending doom Earth is about ready to have, whether it's ecological or nuclear war, something like that. And uh, whatever's on your head is either helping feed it into your brain or they are gauging your responses to these coming events or possible events. But it doesn't seem to be something like they are uh, like a Rorschach test, per se. Or maybe it's their version of a Rorschach test. But uh, it doesn't seem to be like that. But uh, the MK Ultra, like my lab stuff, yeah, that's a lot more psychological in nature. I'm interested in this gold room. That's just all I got to say. Yeah, uh, I... Like some of this deeper UFO lore is not so not so far touched in the Netflix Encounter series. Like this is some deep UFO story stuff. Like pretty deep. A lot of the abduction stories uh, mimic one another. There are variations throughout a lot of these, uh, but they're harder to come by, especially when it comes to praying mantis men and like insectoids. Those are a little bit more rare than the the little grays, uh, for whatever reason, harder to come by. All right, Joe, let's uh, go over the. Unless you have any more UFO questions, uh, Cratchit. Nope. No. If we, if, if there's no more in the gold room, I'm out. Okay. All right. Maybe next time. <laughs>